Well, good evening, High Street family. I want to welcome you into our Wednesday evening Bible study. Whether you are here in the room with us, whether you are joining us online, we want to say welcome. We are glad that you are here. Um, we typically would start with a song, but uh, Brother Daryl isn't here tonight, so we'll just move right into um, our time of prayer, and then we'll move into our study uh, tonight. Uh, just a couple of folks to, uh, to, to mention, a um, couple of things to, to bring your attention for prayer, um, and then I'll open it up to see if anybody in the room has um, anything as well. Uh, number one, I want to be in prayer for Dwayne Blackstock. Um, he had a procedure that was scheduled for today, a biopsy that was scheduled for today, uh, but he was unable to go through uh, with that, so we want to keep him in prayer. Um, it'll be rescheduled for a later time, uh, but be be in prayer for him. I uh, want to continue to remember Glenda Burton, who's in treatment week, which uh, is probably why Daryl's not with us tonight. Uh, so we want to pray for her, um, continue to lift her up. Um, also want to pray for Tommy and Marilyn Burns. Both of them have procedures coming up. Um, I think Tommy's is at the end of this week and Maryland's is at the first of next week or vice versa, one or the other. Um, and so we want to be in prayer for both of them. Um, also want to be in prayer for uh, Connie Glovier, Carol Dean Whalen, um, both of whom are under the weather. Um, so want to lift them up in prayer. Also want you to remember a couple of upcoming ministries that are happening this weekend. Uh, first, on Friday night, we've got the ladies' tea. Um, that is coming. And then on Saturday, the backpack giveaway. So all the backpacks that were here on Sunday are gone. They have traveled, uh, I think, to the old sanctuary. And my guess is they're going to travel back um, in here for Saturday's giveaway. Um, so be in prayer for that. Be in prayer for the kids who will receive those backpacks and their families. Um, and then this coming Sunday evening, we have our uh, Lottie Moon uh, Christmas auction. Um, and dinner on Sunday night. And we're also going to be joined by uh, the Charlie and Shannon Worthy, who are uh, IMB missionaries to Italy. Uh, they'll be with us and be speaking with us, uh, speaking to us on Sunday night. Um, so I want to keep them in mind as well um, and pray for all of the activities that are happening this weekend. Um, also, and, and we'll touch on this in a moment when we begin our study, but also remember that it is week of prayer for international missions. Um, and so if you didn't pick up one of those uh, uh, booklets, uh, there are some available um, back on the offering boxes on either side. Pick up one of those. I would encourage you to pick one up, um, read through those um, daily, and pray for um, our IMB missionaries and the folks that they are seeking to reach on the field. Um, also would ask you guys to pray for our Supreme Court justices. If you've watched the news today, um, you know that they heard oral arguments on um, the, the uh, I forgot the exact name of the case, Dobbs versus, well, that's the old case. The, the case today was Dobbs versus the state of Mississippi, I think. But if you've, if you've paid any attention, you know that in that case, the justices have uh, the opportunity to effectively overturn uh, Roe versus Wade. Um, and so um, if, if we need to be praying for our Supreme Court justices who will uh, be making those decisions, we probably won't hear anything out of that until uh, later this summer. Uh, but the, the arguments took place today. Um, and so I would encourage you to pray uh, for our justices, pray for uh, the end of abortion in our country. This won't completely wipe it out, but essentially if they do uh, overturn Roe v. Wade, it would return it to a state's matter and state by state could, could make decisions. But so we want to pray uh, for that. We want to pray uh, for women who are in crisis um, in the meantime, um, and just pray, um, pray that for the whole situation that we would see an end to um, abortion in, in America. Um, who else has prayer requests tonight? All right. 
the room is awkwardly silent. So I'm sure there are others um, that you have on your heart, maybe ones that you don't want to mention, but we'll remember all of those as well. So let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, um, and then we will jump into our uh, study tonight. Father, we're thankful this evening for uh, your goodness, your mercy, and grace. Uh, Father, you loved us, you do love us, and you continue to demonstrate that love for us day by day. So, Father, we thank you uh, for all that you are to us, um, for sustaining us, um, and for your great care over our lives. Uh, Father, we have a, a pretty lengthy list of folks to be praying for tonight, and Lord, you know each and every one of those needs. Uh, for those who have uh, sicknesses, for those who have upcoming procedures, um, for uh, our um, upcoming uh, ministry events that are happening this weekend, um, for our international missionaries um, that are on the field serving. Lord, we pray uh, that you would uh, be with each and every one of them, uh, be with all of the ministries that they are involved in, uh, pray for the people that they are seeking to reach, that you would open their hearts to, to hear the gospel. Um, and Father, we pray for lives to be changed to the work of um, our International Mission Board missionaries that are serving around the world. Father, we lift up our country to you. In particular, we lift up our Supreme Court justices today uh, and pray that you would be with them. Um, as they begin the deliberation over the arguments that they heard today on um, this critical case that has the opportunity to overturn um, uh, Roe versus Wade in this country. And uh, Father, we pray that, that, um, that when all is said and done, that there would be, uh, it would be much, much harder uh, to obtain an abortion in this country. Um, and that lives would be saved. Um, and Father, we pray for uh, folks in the middle of, of those kinds of decisions now, and, and just pray that you would help them to choose life um, for um, their unborn children. So Father, we uh, lift all of these things up to you and so many more that are on our hearts and minds this evening. We pray that you would meet each and every need according to your good and perfect will. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you got a Bible, let me invite you to grab it and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'd mention we're, we're going to do something a little bit different tonight. Um, this is the international... I don't know why that did that. This is the uh, week of prayer for international missions. Um, and so, again, I would encourage you, if you've not picked up one of those uh, pamphlets, to, to grab one on your way out and pray for our missionaries. Um, you don't just have to use that this week. You can use it to pray um, in the coming weeks. Maybe I need to move less. That might help. Um, so, um, what I thought we would do tonight is, in, in light of the fact that is the week of prayer for international missions, um, is to kind of go back to the beginning. Um, this is a, a study that I uh, uh, led um, not long after I got here. So it's been about six or seven years ago. Um, and um, I'm guessing that almost all of you, none of you, remember it um, because I didn't completely remember it. So um, I thought it'd be okay to bring it back out. And what we're going to do tonight is we're going to kind of launch from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, but then we're going to, to, to think about and talk about the life of uh, the first American Baptist missionary. Does anybody have any idea who that was? Yeah, Adoniram Judson. So we're going to talk about his life uh, tonight. And so I want to begin by laying a scriptural foundation from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and then we'll turn our attention to Adoniram Judson um, and his life, kind of talking about the story of his life to see how the truths of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 played out in his life. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, we're going to read a few verses here at the beginning. 
Apostle Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit these words. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as servant, as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, and he's underscoring here the reality that those who believe and proclaim the gospel will suffer. Chapter 4 begins, we pick up in the middle of Paul's argument, and he says, therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. Well, what ministry is Paul talking about? Well, if we look back to chapter 3, we see that Paul describes himself as a minister of a new covenant, a covenant uh, not of the letter, i.e., not of the law, but rather of the Spirit. In other words, uh, the ministry that Paul's referring to is a ministry of the gospel. Later in chapter 5, he refers to it as a ministry of reconciliation, uh, but it's all the same. Paul says, I'm a minister of the gospel by the mercy of God. He says, I'm not ashamed of this gospel. As he continues on in chapter 4, he says, we refuse to practice cunning, to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. So Paul says our task is to share the gospel with everyone, and he does so unashamedly. He isn't trying to trick anyone or to uh, manipulate anyone, nor is he seeking to water down the truth to make it more appealing. He simply shares the truth of the gospel to everyone. Now, he acknowledges, even in this passage, that there will be many who will refuse to listen. There will be many who will not see the glories of Christ uh, because they have been blinded to it by the God of this age. But nevertheless, he says, we will continue to proclaim not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and God will work to draw men and women and boys and girls to himself through our declaration of gospel truth. So Paul acknowledges even uh, here the dual reality that God is the one who works to bring men and women and boys and girls to salvation, and that we have also a responsibility to share the gospel with everyone. So that dual reality exists. And notice what he says doing so um, would bring. He says doing so, if we are faithful to believe and to share the gospel, it will bring suffering in the life of the believers. Notice what he says in verse 7. He says, we have this treasure The treasure he's talking about there is the gospel. He says, we have this treasure in jars of clay. In other words, uh, talking about the the frailty of our human bodies and and, uh, frailty of who we are. We have this treasure in jars of clay 
to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. And then notice what he says in verse seven, or excuse me, verse eight. He says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Notice that Paul is describing both a physical and an emotional toll that will come to those who have this ministry of sharing the gospel with non-believers. What Paul is describing here is the reality that everyone who has received, everyone who, has, uh, who declares the gospel will suffer. Th- those who have been given this ministry of the new covenant, which, um, by the way, includes all of us. All of us have been given the ministry of gospel proclamation. Uh, He says everybody who, who has been given this ministry will suffer. And there's perhaps no one who came to understand this more in his life um, than Adoniram Judson. Let me just tell you, uh, give you a, a kind of a a commercial here up front. A lot of the a lot of this uh, that we're getting ready to talk about comes from um, this book, and I would highly recommend you. I know it's a kind of a thick book, but um, just to encourage you, it has really small print as well. Uh, so uh, I would highly encourage you to pick up this book and read it for yourself um, if you have not, which I'm guessing most of you probably haven't. Um, it's called To the Golden Shore, uh, The Life of Adoniram Judson uh, by Courtney Anderson. It was originally written in the 1950s, um, and this, I think, was reprinted in the late 80s. Uh, but a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight comes from this book, so I would encourage you um, to read this um, if you have not. Um, I, I would um, encourage you to, to pick up a practice that I started a few years ago, um, which is to, to pick out a Christian missionary or a, a, a Christian from, past, uh, from the past and to read at least one biography a year um, on somebody else's life. Um, and I read this one several, several years ago, and um, I think you'll find tonight um, that um, the life of Adoniram uh, Judson is going to be an encouragement to us tonight. So where William Carey is regarded as the father of modern missions, uh, Judson is in the same light regarded as the father of the American missionary movement, and in particular, the American Baptist missionary movement. Um, Adoniram was born in um, Malden, Massachusetts in 1788 to Adoniram Sr. and his wife, Abigail. Um, Adoniram Sr. was a Congregationalist pastor, uh, which is a denomination that you would have to look really, really hard for these days to find. Um, Congregationalist churches back in that day uh, really looked like uh, kind of a a Presbyterian Baptist hybrid. Um, They resembled the Presbyterians in their doctrine, um, and they resembled the Baptists in their polity, which is why they were known as Congregationalist. Um, And so um, he was born into a pastor's home, um, yet despite um, this upbringing, Adoniram did not come to faith until the age of uh, 20. Um, Early on, it was clear to see that Adoniram was an exceptional child. He began reading at the age of three, uh, was taking navigation lessons by age 10. He studied theology as a young boy, entered Providence College, um, which would change its name to Brown University during uh, Judson's time there. He entered that college at the age of 16. Um, How many 16-year-olds do you guys know that are ready for college now? Not not many, right? So, uh, but here's the thing. The college quickly discovered 
that Judson was advanced enough in his studies that there really wasn't any need for him to take freshman classes, so he was admitted to the school at the age of 16 as a sophomore. Um, so um, just a really intelligent um, young man. It was also during this time in college that Judson made an about face um, from his parents' faith and became a deist. Uh, now, deist is a person who believes in the existence of God, but they do so purely from a rationalist standpoint. So they believe that God exists. They believe that God created uh, the world, but he does not intervene in the world in any way. And so they reject the notion that there would be this supernatural deity who would interact with uh, the world he created, and in particular with human beings. Uh, Judson's conversion to deism was largely due to the influence of a brilliant, unbelieving student that he befriended at the college um, who was from Belfast, Maine, and his name was Jacob Eames. So Jacob Eames kind of was the influence that led him away from his Christian faith to uh, deism. Um, when he graduated from college, Judson left home after revealing his true beliefs to his parents, which caused a, a great deal of unrest and debates with his father um, and tears and pleadings from his mother to return to Christ. So he left, left home um, and went to New York in hopes of becoming a playwright. Um, he wanted to write theatrical works for the stage. And he made it to New York, but he very quickly realized that there was no future for him there. Um, he didn't do a very good job at picking up jobs at becoming a playwright. So he left to return to his uncle's home, who was also pastor, to retrieve a horse that he had left there um, and really didn't have any plans beyond that. But upon arriving at his uncle's home, um, he met a young man who was... A minister. He was covering for his uncle who was um, away um, from home and once he got there it was late in the day so rather than continuing on he decided uh, to stay the night there at his uncle uncle's home. So these two young men um, had conversations that night and Adoniram left the next morning very impressed with this young minister's warmth and with his piousness. And that set the stage for the night that would change everything in Adoniram's life. So he journeyed that day and into the evening. Thoughts harkened back to that conversation he had had the night before with this young minister. Approaching nightfall, he made his way to a small village. He, he found the inn there, stabled his horse, and he asked the innkeeper for a room. The innkeeper said, listen, the, the inn is basically full. I only have one room available, but I have to warn you, it is next door to a young man who is critically ill um, and perhaps even dying. Um, and that you're probably, if you take the room, you're probably going to be disturbed by the sounds of people coming and going all night long. Had Nairam assured him that wouldn't be the case, um, it wouldn't be bothered, and he took the room. But as the night wore on, he couldn't sleep. He heard the sounds of people coming and going. But that didn't bother him so much as the thought that this man in the next room might not be prepared for death. In light of the conversation he'd had with the young minister the night before, he also began to question if he was prepared for death. As Courtney Anderson in To the Golden Shore describes it, he, he says this, a confusing coil of speculation unwound itself as he lay half dreaming, half waking. He wondered how he himself would face death. His father would welcome it as a door opening outward to immortal glory. So much his creed had done for him. But to Adoniram the son, the free thinker, the deist, the infidel, lying huddled under the covers, death was not an exit, 
or excuse me, death was an exit, not an entrance. It was a door to an empty pit, to darkness darker than night. At best, to extinction. At worst, to what? On this matter, his philosophy was silent. It had no answer, but who knows? There was a terror in these thoughts, but soon he talked himself out of them. After all, what would his classmates at Brown say about his terrors? And above all, what would his friend Jacob Eames say? I mean, he had imagined Jacob's laughter, and he felt shame. The next morning, Adoniram rose to leave. His apprehensions had vanished with the darkness of the night. So he readied himself. He proceeded downstairs to saddle his horse, to settle his bill with the innkeeper. And when he was doing that, he noticed kind of a somber look on the innkeeper's face. And so he casually asked the question about the man in the next room. Was he better? But the innkeeper replied to him, unfortunately, he passed away. And just as he had settled himself to move on from his thoughts, he asked the fateful question to the innkeeper. He said, do you know who he was? To which the innkeeper replied, oh, yes, a young man from the college in Providence. Name was Eames. Jacob Eames. As Adoniram tried to continue after this devastating news, one word came to his mind over and over again. Lost. Eames was lost. Both in a physical and in a spiritual sense. Very soon, Adoniram came to realized that he too was lost. And so he ended his traveling, he returned home, he entered Andover Theological Seminary, when, where he soon repented and turned from his sin, placed his faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone, committed himself to a life of service. While he was at Andover, he joined a group called the Brethren, which was an outgrowth of the famous Haystack Revival. Um, through the influence of this group, he answered the call to become a missionary. While doing that, he turned down several opportunities to teach theology at the college le level and also turned down several opportunities to pastor prestigious churches in the area. It, it was also during this time that he felt he, that he met and he fell smitten for a young lady named Anne Hazeltine. Um, who everyone called Nancy. I don't know where they get that, but uh, they called her Nancy, even though her name was Anne. Now, you can imagine the dilemma that that presented, considering that by this time it was well known that Adoniram was planning to be a missionary, most likely in India, um, much like William Carey, who had gone before the English missionary. Uh, there were many... Um, even within the churches there, who, who just simply did not understand why anyone would want to leave home to gear, carry the gospel to who they called heathen, not to mention asking a young lady to come with you. And so Adoniram declared his intentions to be a suitor to Nancy by writing her a letter. It was several days before she replied, but in it she wrote that her parents would have to consent before she could even consider um, anything like this or even consider Adoniram. Though in her private journal, it was clear that she liked him, but was wrestling with whether or not she could commit herself to God to be used however he would see fit. She determined that she could, if God so chose, be willing to leave it all to carry the gospel to the heathen. For Adoniram's part, after receiving Nancy's letter uh, back, he promptly sat down and composed a letter to her father. In it, he wrote this. 
I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring to see her no more in this world. Whether you can consent to her departure to a heathen land and her subjection to the hardships and sufferings of a missionary life. Whether you can consent to her exposure to the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every kind of want and distress, to degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. Can you consent to all of this for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and for you? For the sake of perishing immortal souls, for the sake of Zion and the glory of God, can you consent to all this in hope of soon meeting your daughter in the world of glory with a crown of righteousness brightened by the acclamations of praise which shall redound to her Savior from heathen saved through her means from eternal woe and despair. How would you like to get a letter like that? As you might imagine, that was a difficult letter to receive, but her father, being a, uh, a very pious man himself, um, left the matter up to his daughter. She eventually consented. Within a year's time, they had married and were boarding a ship with another couple, Samuel and Harriet Newell, heading to Calcutta, India, with the intention of going on to Burma, um, a place where no Christian missionary had yet attempted to go uh, because the people of Burma at that time were, were largely a, a savage people. Um, it's worth noting that Adoniram um, left uh, the United States as a Congregationalist missionary, but during the voyage, as he was translating the Greek New Testament, he became convinced that the Scripture nowhere taught infant baptism or baptism by sprinkling. And in fact, that every time the Greek word translated baptism was used in the Scripture, it was always referring to baptism by immersion. So, by the time he arrived in India... Adoniram Judson had become a Baptist um, and was soon baptized by an associate of William Carey's. Uh, that, of course, created a pretty huge problem uh, for them, considering that all of their funding was from Congregationalist churches back home that expected them to hold the same beliefs and practices um, that they did. And so it would mean that they would have to give back the funding to the Congregationalist and then to seek funding from Baptist churches all while they were already on the field. So that was kind of a pressing matter. But there was an even more pressing matter than that. Upon their arrival, they were advised by uh, William Carey and others not to continue on to Burma uh, because it was too dangerous. But they were also not allowed to stay in India. Um, they were forced by the East India Company, which was the English government of India, to leave India as well. So they tried to settle in a couple of other places, but they were also forced to leave those places. They spent four months on the Isle of France before they were forced to leave there. And so that left them basically with two options. They could return to England um, or they could sail for Burma. They chose to sail to Rangoon, Burma, and they arrived there on July the 13th, 1812. Um, it was here in Burma that by their blood, sweat, and labor that the gospel would be planted and eventually take root among the Burmese people. It certainly was not easy uh, the first several years were given to creating a home and learning uh, the dialect. You got to remember, back then there was no such thing as Rosetta Stone. Uh, there was no such thing as Google Translate. 
Um, there was not even a Burmese grammar that they could learn from. Um, there were no English-speaking teachers. So they simply had to learn the language on their own. And they did. And as Adoniram learned the language, he began to translate the Bible into Burmese, beginning with the Gospel of Matthew. He also began writing tracts that explained the Gospel. They were in Burma seven years before Adoniram even ventured to preach his first public sermon. But on June the 27th, 1819, Adoniram baptized his first Burmese convert. By 1822, there were 18 converts that he could count after nearly 10 years of labor in Burma. Those first 10 years were, were difficult, suffering, sicknesses, the death of two children. But there was fruit to show from it. Eighteen converts within ten years. The days ahead would prove to be even more tumultuous for them, and there was certainly much more suffering to come. In 1824, uh, war broke out between the Burmese uh, people and the English government of India. Um, and at about that time, Adoniram had decided um, that he was going to seek to take the gospel further inland from Rangoon on the coast. And so he and um, Anne and the family moved to the capital city of Ava, which was inland. But when the war broke out, they were mistaken for English spies, even though they were American and not English. Um, and on June the 8th, 1824, Adoniram was arrested and placed in what was known as the death prison. Um, within this prison, he was placed in a, in a cell, uh, really a room, that measured 40 feet by 30 feet with a five-foot-high ceiling. Um, so basically a, a box of a room. I'm 6'2", so you can imagine the ceiling it would have been shorter than, than me. Um, 40 feet by 30 feet. You might say, well, that's not too bad. 40 feet by 30 feet, that's not, that's, that's not a lot of room, but it's not, you know, but, you know, it, it does give him a little bit of room. Till you realize that it was not just him, but it was crammed with nearly a hundred prisoners. Both sexes, various nationalities, all nearly naked, half famished. I mean, it, it was downright inhumane. The room was never clean. Prisoners were only let out once per day to relieve themselves. He was also laden with five sets of fetters on his legs and ankles that weighed about 14 pounds. At night, they would place ba a bamboo pole between their legs and shackles, and they would raise their feet up by means of a pulley to a height that allowed only their head and their shoulders to remain on the ground. And that's how they had to sleep. Throughout this time, Nancy would bring him food to help sustain him, but the longer he remained in prison, as you can imagine, the weaker he became. Pretty soon, he was transferred to another prison, and the journey to get to that prison almost killed him. Um, Nancy followed him, even though She'd recently given birth to um, their daughter, Maria, and her strength was beginning to weaken as well. It wasn't long before both Nancy and the baby contracted smallpox, um, and Nancy soon contracted spotted fever, which brought her to death's doorstep. 
So much so that she petitioned the guards to allow Adoniram to come out of prison and carry little baby Maria through the streets so that he could beg Burmese mothers to nurse the baby because Nancy wasn't able to because she was so sick. Well, she wasn't getting any better, and eventually she stopped coming to visit Adoniram in prison altogether. By the time he was released, he feared the worst for what he would find when he returned home. So hear these words of Eugene Harrison as he writes about that experience. He writes, One of the most pathetic pages in Christian missions is that which describes the scene when Judson was finally released and returned to the mission house seeking Anne, who had failed to visit him for some weeks. As he ambles down the street as fast as his maimed ankles would permit, the tormenting question kept repeating itself. Is Anne still alive? Upon reaching the house, the first object to attract his attention was a fat, half-naked Burman woman squatting in the ashes beside a pan of coals and holding on her knees an emaciated baby so begrimed with dirt that it did not occur to him that it could be his own. Across the foot of the bed, as though she had fallen there, lay a human object that, at first glance, was no more recognizable than his child. The face was of a ghastly paleness. The body shrunken to the last degree of emaciation. The glossy black curls had all been shorn from the finely shaped head. There lay the faithful and devoted wife who had followed him so unwearily from prison to prison, ever alleviating his distresses and consoling him in his trials. Presently, Anne felt warm tears falling upon her face and, rousing from her days, saw Adoniram at her side. She was suffering from spotted fever and cerebral meningitis. Amazingly, she survived, but only briefly. In less than a year, while away out of necessity, he received, Adoniram received what is known as the Black Sealed Letter. Told by its deliverer that he was sorry to inform Adoniram of the death of his little Maria, he opened the letter only to read the following. My dear sir, to one who has suffered so much and with such exemplary fortitude, there needs little preface to tell a tale of distress. It was cruel indeed to torture you with doubt and suspense. To sum up the unhappy tidings in a few words, Mrs. Judson is no more. As devastating as that was, within six months, the little baby Maria would die as well. As you might imagine, that would plunge anybody into a state of despair. And it was for him as well. He was kind of plunged into this, despa- this state of despair for a period of months, which drove him to uh, live, go out and live in the jungle like a hermit. Um, while he was there, he dug a grave in the middle of the jungle, and he just sat beside it, staring into it. He eventually came out of the stupor, and in time he was able to continue uh, his gospel work in Burma. Uh, He would marry twice more after that. In 1834, he married married Sarah Boardman, uh, who was a young lady who had lost her husband on the mission field as well. Uh, They were married for 11 years before she died. She would bear eight children um, to him, five of whom would survive into adulthood. Um, In 1846, he returned to America for a brief sabbatical after uh, Sarah had died. died, And uh, while he was there, he married Emily Chabot. 
They returned to Burma and were married not quite four years before Adoniram died um, on April the 12th, 1850. Again, a short summary of this man's life. You can find a whole lot more here in this book. But as we kind of wind this down tonight, what was the impact of this great missionary? What's in a life? What was the impact of his life? Well, by 1834... Adoniram had finished a Burmese translation of the Bible. By 1840, he had completed a revision of it. That, of course, was the first Bible that was translated into the Burmese language. He would live to see, by 1850, he would leave, live to see about 7,000 Burmese people come to faith in Christ. By the time of his death, 63 congregations had been established under 163 missionaries and native pastors and assistants. All that by 1850. Today, the Myanmar Baptist Convention alone, which is present-day Burma, boasts more than 1.7 million members scattered throughout more than 3,513 plus churches. All of that can be traced to the move of God in the heart of a young man from Massachusetts who was burdened to see the gospel made known to the heathen of Burma. question remains why why would he go why risk the suffering the the heartache the torture the sickness the sting of death when he could have certainly had a stable even fruitful ministry in new england or to bring it to today you know we're praying for missionaries on the field now in our um we could prayer guides and, and other missionaries that are serving with the International Mission Board. Why would they leave to go to take the gospel to places where Christ has not been named? I think the answer lies in Second Corinthians chapter four. Paul describes the suffering that would come for those who would proclaim the gospel. We looked at that as we began tonight. But he concludes chapter 4 by showing us why anybody would endure such things, such suffering for the sake of the gospel. Notice what he says beginning in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 16. He says, so we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Why would Judson endure the suffering, the heartache, the torture, the sickness, the sting of death? Because he knew that even all of that was light, momentary affliction that is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. He understood 
what Paul was saying here. God had called him to Burma. He was obedient to the call. So as we leave tonight, the question for us is simple. Where is God calling us? Now, he may be calling you to Burma or somewhere else overseas. Then again, he might be. But he may be simply calling you to go across the street. Across town. Where is it that God is calling us? Whatever that is for you, the question, again, is simple. Will you be obedient? Knowing that whatever you might face, Paul says, is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all compare. Adoniram and Anne answered the call. Will we be willing to answer the call and go wherever he leads? Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this time that we've had together tonight. Thank you for um, the life of a great man of faith from history who even today is teaching us what it means to follow the call of God on our lives and to go where he's called us to go no matter what may face us for the sake of the gospel because we recognize that um, Whatever we may face in life, whatever suffering or sickness or uh, trial or tribulation we may face in this life is light momentary affliction. That's not worth comparing. That is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all compare. So Father, whatever it is that you are calling us to, We pray that you would speak clearly, that we would hear your call, and that we would be faithful to be obedient to wherever you are leading us. Father, we do want to lift up all of those who have answered the call. Uh, Some who are uh, taking the gospel to places in this country, others who are taking the gospel around the world. Father, Particularly in this week, we want to remember those who are uh, taking the gospel to peoples around the world. And particularly, we want to pray for our international mission board missionaries who are serving faithfully wherever you've called them, wherever you've placed them. We pray that you would use them uh, to see lives changed by the power of the gospel. We pray that you would sustain them. We pray that you would be with their families. We pray that you would Just encourage them in this time. And Father, we'll be quick to give you all of the glory for it. For you alone are worthy. We'll ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thanks for being here. We'll see you Sunday or before.